Um, so good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Talent Finders would like to welcome Trailblazer, first NFL female coach, uh, PhD sports uh, psychology um, and gold medalist, Dr. Jane Welter. So welcome, Jane. Good morning. How are you? Good, thank you. Um, so Jane, firstly, I'd like to congratulate you on all your achievements. So can you please share with us uh, how your journey started? Um, uh, and to where you are today? Well, obviously that would be a, a, a little bit of a long story, but, um, you know, as a kid, I was really active, always in sports. Um, also, I think very just self-motivated and intellectually curious. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a, I should say I have a father who is um, a Vietnam veteran uh, who earned a silver star and two bronze stars, coupled Amazing. with a mom who was an artist. So Amazing. It was this, yeah, it was this very like um, great mix, I think, as a kid of, you know, you have a different way of thinking with my mom, like we would make beauty out of anything She's probably one of the most like loving, kind people you've ever had in your life. And, you know, my dad was this man who had been in combat. Um, he also was a professional race car driver at one point and a chiropractor. So wow. he was, you know, this combination of toughness and intelligence. And I just didn't really think of it in any other way. Um, yeah. You know, and my dad didn't have a son, so it wasn't like, you know, oh, well, the boys can do that. It was like, nope, the kids can do that. And that was me and my sister. Yeah. So, and that's an amazing way to grow up. It is. And, you know, I, I tell people I didn't really think of it any other way. Yeah. Because my dad was like, they can do it. You know, we would go fishing as kids. I caught my first blue marlin at 14. And wow. it's not one of those things where, you know, you you say, oh, well, you know, that's a big fish. She can't catch it. You know, yeah. you, you get handed the fishing rod. It's your fish and the fish doesn't care if you're a girl or a boy, like you either catch it or you don't. And hundred percent. And I think that's a really good lesson um, yeah. for kids and girls specifically um, to know that it, it really is what you do. Um, you either catch it or you don't. You, you yeah. can't say the fish was was biased right so we were always really active um my my dad would tell you um that i was always kind of this think differently kid um i remember what i found out about like joan of arc i yeah. went home and and just matter of factly told my dad i said you know dad it's a really good thing i was born now and he's jenny why is that and i said Oh, daddy, they would have burned me at the stake. Right? Like, <laughs> sure. I saw, yeah, I mean, I saw nothing wrong with um, this woman who dressed up in, in male armor and led, um, led troops into battle, right? Like, why not? Exactly. Um, and so I think that childhood for any of us, the, the way that we are imprinted really young then does set the stage for what we become in life. Yeah. Um, I was a great athlete, always different sports. Um, and when I got to college, I found rugby. Um, and rugby was the closest thing I'd ever seen to football that girls were allowed to play. You know, it was like soccer meets football and they don't need pads. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this. Amazing. And yeah, because obviously I come from a country where rugby is a big, uh, big sport, so I can relate. Exactly. Well, exactly. And, you know, and that's one of the reasons why, though people know me for American football, I always make sure to credit my rugby roots yeah. in my success because rugby is a more global game. And, you know, I, I think there would be more appreciation of both sports, right? Whether it's in the US where there's still a lot of people who wouldn't be able to tell you what a try was or 
that your your number is your position or any of that stuff in the states yeah. and internationally kind of the same thing with american football and i think we'd have a much better global conversation and love of both sports yeah. if more people knew how similar they really were um and for me it was an entree to tackle sports that taught me to be one of the best tacklers in the world um wow. you know because you give me pads and a helmet after i learned the proper form in rugby and i was definitely not afraid of anybody amazing um, and people who watched uh watch my tape to this day uh they were like oh yeah definitely a rugger you 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 rolled out of all your tackles. I'm like, absolutely. I don't want to be persuaded off the ball on the ground. I'm not standing in the middle of that pile and getting my face stepped on. Thank you very much. No, <laughs> of course. But um, in America, they don't get that. You know, they're, they're teaching kids like, you know, to do a gator roll tackle, which is great. It's great technique, but they don't understand why. Yeah. Um, and in rugby, we do it naturally because we don't want to be, you know, on the bottom of the rocker mall, right? Like you just, it's not a really fun place to be. No, yeah, for sure. Um, so you were the first uh, female NFL coach um, in the summer of 2015, um, and you served as a linebacker coach for the Arizona Cardinals, which is an incredible achievement in a highly competitive and cutthroat and male dominated sport. So can you please share with us what that process and experience was like for you as a female? Um, and how did you get the job? Um, and what are some of the biggest challenges and obstacles you were faced with, if any? Sure. So the way I made it into men's pro football was that I played. Um, yes. I was the first female to play running back in men's pro football. And I, I often tell people, I'm like, you know, I was one of the best women in the world and nobody cared until I was willing to get tackled by men, yeah. right? It was um, a different entree. It was the number one story in the country for quite some time. And it was, you know, most people didn't even at that point know that women were playing football. Yeah. Um, they, they kind of, after that, wanted to know where I had come from. And in the process of playing that, one, it opened the larger conversation to women in football, which I thought was really exciting. But two, um, I really learned a lot about guys and their environment and being a great teammate to them yeah. um, in a situation where everybody thought it would fail. Um, it was a point of pride. And those guys really, you know, I saw one of the guys the other day, Clinton Solomon, who was a, um, a wide receiver for the Chicago Bears before he was with the Revolution. Yeah. Um, and we were talking the other day and he was great to me. And, you know, I think we all need those male allies um, for, for any woman in a space that, you know, is quote unquote male dominated. What you have to realize is that we're not going there to dominate the males, right? Like no. we, it's it's a matter of being great teammates yeah. and um, making great allies. And Solo was that for me um, on the revolution. Wow. And I, I thanked him the other day because we always see each other when I'm in Dallas. He's one of my favorite people. And, um, you know, I just thanked him for being so great to me when I was there. And he was like, little mama, don't thank me. Like, <sighs> Who changed all of us yeah. like made us all better like we never in our lives thought that we'd play with a woman and like you opened up our mind to what women were capable of in football and yeah. he said I still get asked um you know wasn't that the team with a girl on it and he's like I have to correct him I'm like not a girl like the girl like yeah. our <laughs> and you know, and I think that that was what was special. And I tell that story because people want to start with the Cardinals, but it didn't start with the Cardinals. My yeah. success with the Cardinals started with a great foundation in women's football, being one of the best in the world, getting the street credibility of then playing in men's football and really learning the lesson to, you know, be a great teammate with men in football. 
um, also having a PhD in psychology and a master's in psychology. And then um, all along the way in men's pro football, it was about men seeing something in me that maybe I didn't see in myself yet um, because the football part shone, shone through over, you know, just the girl part. Um, Wendell Davis, who was the head coach of the Texas Revolution the year after I played, he came in as a new head coach and I walked into an event where all the Revolution guys were mm. and we hadn't seen each other since season. And, you know, they were excited to see me and pick me up, toss me around like a football because <laughs> relatively that my yeah. M1, you know. And Wendell said, who is this girl that all my guys love? And they were like, coach, that's your running back. And he told me later, he was like, Jen, I never realized that the guys would love you yeah. like they do. He said, I know everything about you, but that was special. And he called me the next day and he said, all my defensive coordinator, Devin, and I could talk about yesterday was how you have to coach this football team. Amazing. And I said, no. He said, what do you mean? No. So well, girls don't coach football. I mean, that was, that was my gut response because I had never seen a woman coaching men's pro football. Yeah. And he said, you know, I can teach you how to coach football, but I can't teach that, that response that they had to you, that, that credibility that you had, that love they have for you. Like, that's incredibly special. And I said, well, you know, no, coach, like I, I, I've never coached before and um, you want to drop kick me right into men's pro football. Like, no, I don't think I can. And he said, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. And I said, no. And I hung up on him. Wow. And the next day he called me back and told me about myself. He said, do you remember how I told you not a lot of guys were going to give you this opportunity and were taking this job? I said, yeah. He said, good. I took it for you. You're coaching for me. And by the way, you can't quit. Otherwise, the entire narrative surrounding women coaching and men's pro football will be, we had a girl once and she quit. Yeah. And wow, that's so powerful. It is. And it's, you know, it's, for a lot of women, the, the important part of that story is that that's not a football story. That's a, that's a life story. And it's one that many, many women that same struggle face, we will yeah. over check the boxes before we will, you know, apply up or step into a situation. Yeah. And the truth is that guys don't do that, you yeah. know? guys will see a want ad and say, I can be president, right? Like it just, there's not the same mentality. And a lot of that is the pressure of being a minority. Yeah. Um, and, and it's because, you know, not at that point, there were no other women coaching football, particularly in the NFL. And so it wasn't just, you know, how am I going to do? How is Jen Welter going to do? Or, you know, this coach, it was, can women coach in the NFL, yeah. right? Can, will, will males in the NFL take coaching from a woman? Yeah. You know, I was setting the standard for not just myself, but all of womankind. And that is a tough narrative because we as women, as women take things so far to heart and, and we want to do the best to help all of those people that we love and care about. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not just, oh, I'll give it a shot, right? Like, it, <laughs> Exactly. I mean, it's a massive responsibility. It is. And, and it's, it's one that we as women often face as we, you know, look to um take our careers to the highest level right it's like yeah. certain levels are okay they're expected certain roles are expected but once you cross certain boundaries it becomes a statement for all of womankind yeah. not just you 
And that to me is, is the biggest challenge, um, you know, both in, in the willingness to take on that responsibility and the actual job itself, you know, it Absolutely. makes you someone who they watch very closely. And as I like to say, you have many people sitting there waiting, holding their breath, hoping you will face plan. Of course, of course. So what would you say um, out of this has been some of your biggest career lessons um, and how did these help you uh, to where you are today? I think everything that we do um, has an imprint on us psychologically in terms of both what we can do and what we need to do. And we develop, you know, ways of dealing with things. Yeah. Um, for me, I've been in so many awkward situations now or ones where it was that I was different, that humor became and so is a big part of dealing with those situations because, yeah. you know, as a woman in them, you know, guys are funny. They, I, I have found that pretty much above all, they want to know two things. One is that I belong, that yes. I'm there for the right reasons, right? Like, yes. for example, I played against the guys. I was a running back. My job was to get tackled. Yes. And I couldn't get hit by a guy and stand up and say, you can't hit me, I'm a girl. No, <laughs> getting tackled is the job description. Now, thankfully for most of us, as we venture into a new, a new territory, it's yeah. not quite as painful. You know, thankfully the stakes aren't the same, but that was the truth. I didn't need to be the best person out there, but I couldn't use the girl card as an excuse. No. And I think the other part is that, you know, not only do you belong, but can you get along? Yeah. And for me, that's always been where humor comes into place. Um, and just looking at a situation through that lens will also help you develop allies because, you know, just like you're nervous and things are different for you, if you're going into a situation where there has never been a woman before, the guys are nervous too. And yeah. they don't know what to expect, right? It's like, it's like a blind date. Ever been on a blind date, right? Like, you know, you your, your palms are sweaty. You don't know if the guy is gonna be able to hold hands or if you even want to the yeah. guy doesn't know if he's allowed to open the door anymore and then he awkwardly like kind of half drops it and lands <laughs> or you know or he just waits to see if you'll go through the door you know everybody's on such good behavior that you know you're three weeks in of dating and you feel you realize you've learned less than you knew when it started and it was a blind date to begin with yeah right because everybody's been on such good behavior trying so hard to not mess up that they've been anything but themselves and so i always use humor to set the stage and in that um i think try and make it so it it answers the questions before they're asked and lets people off the hook in terms of, you know, I don't get mad at things that are unintentional. It's yeah. the intention. And I think when we laugh it out rather than yell it out, like we end up getting to know each other a lot better and can get through a lot more. So those things have served me well in a lot of situations and give me the confidence to know that it might be a new situation, but I'll probably be okay. Yeah. Um, and that mentality is a part of who I am. And I also realized, you know, really the importance of being a voice and a catalyst for change um, in terms of a big picture, not just being about yourself. Um, because sometimes being about yourself and just per pursuing your career as it might fit on a normal path is different than being an advocate and it's different than being a spokesperson and a voice and you know we all have to look at those turning points 
and decide who we want to be. You know, I've never been a put my head down and keep my mouth shut and just preserve myself kind of person. No. Um, I'm a, I'm a team player. Yeah. And that means that, as I like to say, the opportunity and responsibility of the first is to ensure you're not the last. And if you take that on, that means you will open doors that you are not the one to walk through. And you have to be okay with that because you have to know it was a conscious choice um, for the evolution of the sport overall and not just the evolution of you and yourself. And I think that's a scary place at a time, but if you realize that that's who you are, then you kind of don't have a choice to do it any other way. And so I always pull strength from everybody else, meaning if I'm the person who opened this door, I have to continue to be that person. And it's not about me. It's about all the women that I played with and against were in the trenches with and all of the girls who get to see where they can be in this world um, and have somebody to look to and say, I want to be like her. And that means that you have a certain decision-making process that you have to abide by. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I think it's also what I find so profound and so inspiring is that it's also um, about how um, it's going to show other women and other young uh, girls what is possible. So you also uh, trailblazing or opening that door for other women to show that it's possible. And the, the beautiful part that, of that is, is that, you know, and I actually said something to this effect in the press conference when the, the Cardinals announced me is like, People would always ask me if, you know, or they would say, they would say like, you're living the dream, you're coaching in the NFL. Yeah. And I was like, no, this is not a dream I was permitted to have yeah. because there was no one I could look at and say, I want to be her. But the beauty of this is that now any little girl can dream football, right? Okay. She have a dream that I was never permitted to dream, which means that she has the ability to make choices much earlier in her life to pursue a goal um, or a career in football um, than I did. You know, I didn't get to play football until I was 22 years old. And I lovingly tell people, I'm like, I think if I would have played, you know, maybe when I was a junior, who knows, I might've taken over the planet by now. <laughs> For sure. Well, I think you're doing a, an exceptional job nonetheless, because I think your story is just phenomenal. So I appreciate that. Um, so you've had a very strong and diverse career. And as, um, uh, and as you also became head coach for the Australian women's national team in 2017, how did this come about? Um, and with such a, a strong leadership a role with the Cardinals, what would you say was different with your experience working with women's teams? Well, I don't know, you know, I never put, um, I think women's teams versus men's teams in a bucket because culturally that would be very unfair. Yeah, right? no, for sure. I just you know, wondered whether there was um, a difference in, um, you know, in the camaraderie or the way that you train together or if it was very similar every team has its own culture yes every single one and it's influenced by so many things right it's influenced yes by gender but also by you know cultural background of the players it's um demographics socioeconomic status it's leadership it's all of those things. And as someone with, you know, um, a background in psychology like mine, it makes each one of those situations just, you know, beautiful and splendid and special. And as a coach, 
And what I always say is like, it is on me to learn that culture and to mm-hmm. learn players and to design certain aspects um, of what we do and how we move together based on those, right? Yeah. You know, for Team Australia, I mean, the women in Australia have such a beautiful um, contact sport culture, right? Yeah. And yet American football or gridiron was very young there. Um, most of the players when we were there only had been playing for like three to four years. Yeah. And so we knew as coaches that, you know, that that would be a pretty hard ramp up period to say we were going to necessarily go and win a gold medal. Um, you know, Team USA, I mean, they were all players like me who had been playing for 20 some odd years, yeah. right? But we had players and assistant coaches who loved the game of football and yet it was really hard to get upper level football knowledge like our our position coaches and even a lot of our players were like watching youtube videos and stuff to teach themselves football so for my for me my offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator our goal was to show all of the women and coaches who we considered the ambassadors of the sport for the rest of the country because yeah. they were in different areas um, and they came from different clubs that we could show them what the sport could be like at its highest level and give them exposure to what that looks like and push them to drive the level of gridiron in all of Australia. Yes. So we wanted them all to become um, ambassadors to sport and really help change what that trajectory looked like in their country. And so that mean, meant there was a lot of learning um, in terms of what they had been taught um, and where they could go from where they were. And, you know, I remember, you know, thankfully for me, for example, I have a rugby background, so certain things were common, but like when we did our first scrimmage, I watched some of the defense players like run to the blocker and almost like stop, not try and make the tackle. And it happened with more than one time with more than one player. And it became a matter of like, what is going on? Like, this is a pattern. Yeah. And they were like, well, coach, that's what it looks like on the paper. And I'm like, oh, okay, right. See, that's what it looks like on the paper for the offense. That's what they want to happen. And on defense, we want them to not be able to do that. Yeah. Right. So certain parts became really smoothing out how uh, things integrated. Yeah. Um, they've been running great drills, but uh, the players might not know how to put that drill in action in a play. And so what we had to focus on was a lot different than, you know, in the NFL where they're expected to have all of that um, and all of the technique. And it really is a matter of, you know, film and um, X's and O's and, you know, down and distance stuff that your focus is. So, and then really with Team Australia, bringing a lot of different players and and factions throughout the country together to a cohesive playbook unit and um, mentality. No, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you are known as a, a trailblazer in football, not only having uh, to lead as a coach, but also as the first woman to play um, in men's professional football league, which I know you did touch on earlier for the Texas, uh, with the Texas Revolution. Uh, this must have been a unique experience having to adapt um, as the first uh, female um, in a male contact sport. So how on earth did you achieve that? Like, what was that moment like for you? 
Um, you know, it's, it's honestly first, it's not something I set out to do. Yeah. Um, I, I am as a female, I, though a lot of people have this idea in their head that I'm giant. Um, <laughs> I am actually only five foot two. Wow. And so I'm tiny. And, you know, though I was great in my women's career, people used to ask me all the time, they'd be like, oh, you know, you're so good at football. You've been playing for so long. Like, what are you trying to do? Play in the NFL? And I would like laugh. I'd be like, listen, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm five foot two, 130 pounds. I would never play pro football against men. And then I laugh because it's like, I guess God has a great sense of humor. Yeah. Um, because though it wasn't something I would have set out to do um, when put in the situation, um, I'm also not somebody who's built with a whole lot of quit. So once I was put into the situation, it was like, you know, they're going to have to cut me or kill me, but I'm not quitting no matter what. Um, knowing the implications for all of the other women who were in and loved football. Yeah. And so it really was um, something where I just had to do my best at every, at every point and strive to be a good teammate in whatever that looked like. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who was used to being one of the most dominant players in the world to then go onto a roster where, you know, you're the lowest rung on the totem pole um, and scratching and clawing and fighting to maintain a position on a practice squad. Um, it was humbling and yet a really huge growth period because, you know, I would look for ways that I could maybe help my teammates. And when, for example, I was maybe not dressed for a game on practice squad, um, I had a great mind for what was going on in the game. And, you know, I might see things and I'd be like, hey, all right, next time try this, or you have to watch this, like they're slanting hard this way, watch for a naked boot on the back side, you know, like so don't don't cheat the upfield shoulder. And the guys would be like, oh, she's like our little coach, right? Um, and I guess that was good foreshadowing because when the opportunity came, they were really open to it. So I think that for anybody who steps into those situations that they might feel, you know, as I say, like underweight, um, it's, it's looking at the situation not as you've been in one in the past, but where you can be best in each situation and really listening and learning where you can contribute. Yeah. Um, it was the same thing when I coached for the Cardinals, you know, people would first of all say, how did you command their respect? And I would laugh because if I thought I was commanding the respect, I wouldn't have had it before it even started. Exactly. Right? And so I would tell people, I'm like, I listened a lot. And what do you mean you listened a lot? Like, how can I help you if I don't know what you need help on yeah. and how I can contribute? And I made sure that I wasn't just talking to talk. I was adding value in what I said and did for the players so that they wanted more from me, right? Like if something I told them hit home, you know, they're going to listen again um, as opposed to just a lot of chatter. And so, you know, those are things that at all levels, I, I look to, to learn what the environment is. I think that goes really to my, my training in psychology, where, you know, even in consulting with that, whether I was co consulting with a player, team, coach, didn't matter. Um, I would always tell them like, you know, my job isn't to come in here and guess. I can, yeah. I can guess with the best of anyone, but if you want me to truly be effective, you have to trust me enough to play a game in your cleats and, you know, see the game through your eyes. Yeah. Because the extent that you trust me to bring me into your world will determine 
how much I can help you. Yeah, absolutely. So that leads me to leadership. So leadership or lack of leadership um, is a big subject um, that is constantly a point of discussion. So what would you say makes your leadership style different? And what do you believe needs to change in the current narrative? Well, I think, first of all, one of the most important things with leadership is that it's not one size fits all. Um, there is not one perfect way to lead. No. But for me, it was really owning the facts that my voice and perspective were different. Um, and that diversity in all areas of thought, including leadership, is a strength. And yes. on a team, you know, you have several coaches, which means you have several leaders. And it's not that one of them is better than the others. It's that together, your varied perspective make you able to reach and teach more players than you could individually. Right. And that my leadership style might lend itself to certain situations or certain players at certain times. And hopefully it adds to the collective in that we can reach and teach all of the different personalities on our team and that we are consistent in that. Right. I would say if you are if you are consistent and people know where you stand, they may not always like it, yeah. but they will respect it. Absolutely. Um, it. It's that consistency over time that really gives credibility. Um, you know, I have had people who have reached out to me and, you know, I, I've had it ha happen actually several times this year and they'll start with, you know, I've been watching you for a while or yeah. you've been on my radar for a long time. Well, that means that somebody has been, been watching from afar mm -hmm. and you've impressed them consistently over time. Yeah. It wasn't just one thing that you said or one game that you coached or one team that you were with. It was the total of who you are as it was reflected back through everything that you do. And that is something that, that people respect and they, they know more or less who you're going to be, right? Yeah. It's, you're not going to come in one day and be an alien, right? Yeah. Like we all have bad days, but yeah. fundamentally you're not going to change who you are or what your worldviews are or what your values are and Absolutely. people that have watched as you um, evolve throughout your career, it's that consistency of who you are and what your messaging is and what your approach is that will either make them know without a doubt you're a fit or know without a doubt that you're not, right? Like certain environments I would not be suited to, yeah. but it's not gonna be a surprise to them because I'm not a, you know, I've been this person for a really long time and you either want the football person and the five foot two fearless girl with a PhD and an opinion and um, who's not afraid to share it or you don't. And that comes through consistency. And then one of the things that I do think we need to make sure that we emphasize in leadership in general is the first of all the importance of the humans in the equation yeah. um in in any situation the most valuable asset is your human capital because it's it you can execute a play all day long you can have the greatest x's and o's in the world but it's real people that carry those things out and so it's not just about being a performer yeah. it's about being a leader of people yeah. and the rougher and tougher they are the more they've got going on on the inside and as a coach 
I always say like, if my player's mind is somewhere else, then he's not gonna be any good or she's not gonna be any good to me until I bring their mind back to what we're doing here. Yeah. So I have to know my players well enough to know when something's off and we have to have a relationship that's founded on trust, which will allow them to let me into their, their mind enough to talk about not performance, but real life. Yeah. And that trust that comes through, you know, emotionally investing in your players and leading with empathy is undoubtedly powerful because if a player will trust me to help him or her in their life, then they're sure going to listen when I tell them to, you know, get to heal depth and squeeze the O-line, right? Like they, they already know that I have their best interest in heart. So, and I think that gets overlooked a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, empathy is, is a very powerful element in that. And a lot of the times I think people discount empathy um, and the power of it by putting it into just being a female uh, leadership. Absolutely. And it's also sometimes even con uh, considered a weakness in yep. some respect, for sure. Yep. And I would argue that empathy is a leadership trait, period. Yes. The ability to relate to, understand, and communicate with and motivate players is neither a male nor a female trait, but it is an asset across the board. Absolutely. So you've had a highly decorated uh, career over 14 years and have not only won two gold medals, but also four championships as a member of Team USA. Did this open the door for you? Um, and was there one defining turning point in your career or many that led to where you are today? Uh, I think everything you do is a turning point. Right? Like, <laughs> sure. it, the credibility that I gained in women's football by far is part of what makes me great in everything that I do. Yeah. Um, it's the, it's not necessarily the, the medals or the championships as much as it is the drive and passion and love of the game and love of the women that we sacrifice together for, yes. right? It's, it's and the being, journey. Right, it's being fortified, right? Yes. Through a trial by fire, which, you know, enforces the love that you have. And so that to me is, is the foundation of who I am. Um, mostly all of the things that I've done when entering the the male world were all things I, I couldn't expect couldn't have expected and really became turning points. Um, and I think for me, a lot of people look at like, oh well did you pivot or was it this or was it that? I'm like all this fancy jargon. <laughs> right. But yeah. for me it was the journey. Yeah. It always is. It it still is. It's there, there wasn't one, you know, you know, it wasn't like I said, I want to be president of the United States one day. And that means like, okay, I need to, you know, first serve in local government and then, you know, state government and then national government and, you know, become a policy person and, you know, do all of those things. It wasn't as if there was a, a big goal with really clear steps that I could take to get there. Yeah. Like this isn't a goal or a, an aspiration. A <laughs> right. It's not, yeah. It, yeah. it's my life. And it also sounds to me like your process was very organic. Maybe it wasn't consciously organic, but it sounds like just from, you know, how your process went, it sounds like that process was organic. Absolutely. Yeah, we are organic by nature, right? Absolutely. Like it yeah. is, it is hopefully much more organic than it is contrived because, you know, I even look at people who, um, you know, say we have leadership classes and, and 
you know, ways that, that shape us as a leader. Mm. And I think that's only as good as it's authentic in you. You can, you know, you can read a leadership book, but I don't want you to be a leadership minion because then you're not really yeah. a, leader, you're a follower. Yeah. And that's the problem today because everybody's a coach, everybody's an author, but half of them are living in their grandmother's garages and they don't have credibility or credentials to back up any of what they say. So, Well, and I think it's also, you know, do you have the courage to own your own voice, yeah. right? Like the beauty of diversity and inclusion is to increase the the voices that are in the room and the amount of perspectives which are shared. Yeah. So if you are that different voice, you can't lose your voice as soon as you step into the situation. 100%. So you've also uh, been inducted into the Women's um, First Class Hall of Fame. So can you tell us more about this? Yeah, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, uh, and I don't know if it's the only one, but it is certainly one of the only ones is that, you know, the Pro Football Hall of Fame is one of the only halls that doesn't actually include women. Yeah. Um, and so a group a couple of years ago started the Women's Football Hall of Fame. Um, and I was a first class, first ballot Hall of Famer. Um, and, and to me, that's, you know, it's really powerful because it comes from your peers. It comes from uh, the women who are all in the game. And it's an important step in terms of recognition on the contributions that women have made to football and will continue to make. Yeah. And a lot of those women are, you know, some of my very best friends. and you know, we are the people who fielded the first U.S. national team. And the firsts and the greats uh, that the game will be built on in football are, are still the people, you know, playing today. Yeah. Um, there were women who played before us, obviously, but in this era of football, um, you know, those women are – now the ones who will set the future for the sport as the newer generations come in. Yeah. Um, it's not as it was before where <laughs> women played and then it stopped. Um, those women are doing things like, you know, me going and playing in men's football and opening the door to the NFL. Um, women like my teammate Odessa Jenkins is, you know, her and Elizabeth Jenkins, they have, um, the WNFC, which is, you know, their league that they founded. So, wow. the, you know, and, she, and Odessa was also in the first class, right? And, and so you see these women who are still in the game and we're all ensuring in our own way that the women who are coming now and will come in the future have a, a future that's brighter than, than what we had. And I think that that's what makes it really special. Um, at the same time, you know, I am a person who believes in equality and, you know, Absolutely. I am pushing and working with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I think that women should be included in there. It's not the NFL Hall of Fame. It's the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And yes. there are women who are pros. And so, you know, my coaching shirt um and sarah thomas's um game memorabilia were in the pro football hall of fame in 2015 and it was the first time in the history of the pro football hall of fame that there were artifacts from like women in in coaching and refereeing positions yeah. right so those those i would like to say kind of feet in the door any girl who looks at them, it changes her, her view of the game as a whole, because yeah. it's like, she can see that she could have a place in Canton. And I think that that is an important 
um, legacy to honor. And there is a, a display like on women in football in Canton now, it's not a permanent display, but um, that features a lot of, you know, my football gear from my career, both from the US national team, from when I played in, in women's and then the Texas revolution and then to the Arizona Cardinals. So, um, you know, it has my $12 check and even um, all of my Super Bowl rings and gold medal rings are there because I think that those items are a lot more powerful where girls can see them than they are, you know, in, in my house or on my finger. Absolutely. So I want to touch on sexual harassment in sports, uh, in the sports world in general. Um, is this something that you have personally experienced? What would you say to other women who have gone through um, sexual harassment experiences, especially uh, through fear and intimidation? And how can the narrative be changed? Well, I think the first thing to realize about sexual harassment, I'm not going to speak it to it in sports in general. I'm going to speak as, you know, as a part of society. Yeah. Um, the first part of sexual harassment that really is important to talk about is it's often a power dynamic, right? It's less about um, just gender than it is about power. Absolutely. Right? You don't have the woman um, likely, right? We'll, we'll say likely. It is less likely for the woman who is, you know, the CFO of a finance firm to be harassed by, you know, a male intern, right? Because she is in a position of power. Yeah. Um, sexual harassment and particularly the fear of losing your job if you don't comply or you don't do something along those lines mm -hmm. um, is, is very much so a power dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and so when people ask me if I, for example, experienced that in the NFL, that's a no. And part of the reason is I was the coach. Yes, right? for sure. So you were in a different position. Yes. And those yes. guys were all very respectful. I never, I never encountered anything like that. But a lot of that is, is because of, you know, the position that you're in. And mm -hmm. so one of the things we have to look at, number one is, creating great male allies. Um, yeah. A lot of those conversations in terms of a toxic workplace culture or sexual harassment um, are, are best informed um, by having male allies because yeah. a lot of the times the women won't hear it or they'll feel like, you know, they're the only one around who hears it. Yeah. And a guy who says, man, that's not cool right, set the standard that this isn't, a, isn't acceptable as a whole to treat women that way. No. And because the women may or may or may not hear it, right? They are, may or may not be exposed to all of it if yeah. there's a group of guys. But if the guys say like, no, I don't like that, man, like I, I would hate it if you talk to my wife like that or, you know, um, would you say, how would you feel if that was your sister? right? And you make it very personal. Um, yeah. That sets the standard of what is or is not acceptable in a culture. It's the same thing with bullies, right? Bullies are, are, are mean because of insecurity. It's a reflection of their insecurity, not their strength. So, Absolutely. Um, so a lot of the times they're doing it to try and fit in. And when you create a culture where it's established that that's not acceptable, it's a lot less likely. Now, that doesn't solve everything, but it sure does give, number one, the guys in the situation some ownership so they don't feel helpless and just not like it, but also not know what to do. Um, and for the girls, it gives them, you know, good male allies, right? Solo yeah, which was is like, so important. Yeah. Solo so was like that with me. He said, you know, don't you dare ever let 
anything, right? And it wasn't necessarily just about that bother you, right? Like you give them nothing. If something bothers you, come tell me and let me handle it, right? Let me fight some of those battles for you because we need to establish it that you're not separate from our locker room. You are a part of our locker room and yeah. you are fighting battles on your own. You'll have one battle and then the next battle and then the next battle. He said, we need these guys to be not fighting against you, but fighting for you. Cause Absolutely. we have other people you have to go up against. And so those male allies become really, really powerful in determining corporate culture. Yeah. And, you know, as women, you also have the opportunity in that culture to differentiate between, you know, what is really just banter and what is like Truth. what is offensive or where the intent is bad. Yeah. And that to me is a place I always say where humor is really powerful because you can set the standard of what is and isn't okay yeah. without freaking out because you give the guy a chance to recover. I always say there's, you know, there's one give me, there's one time where you just assume that it was a, con a disconnection between brain and mouth. Um, yeah. We've all had them and that's not just a female. We've all had them. Like we have all had them. Um, and so we also can use that position to help change them in like, you know, hey, you do realize you said that out loud, right? Yeah. It's one of my most uh, powerful statements. I use it all the time because I can just laugh. And if For someone, sure. it will, and if somebody didn't mean what they said to be mean, like it was just a jumbled up collection of words that turned out tragically, yeah. they will immediately say, oh my gosh, I, that's not what I meant. I'm so sorry. And you get to say, oh no, I know what you meant. It's fine. Yeah. I'm just, you know, coaching you up on life right here. Like, let's never put that, that collection of words together ever again. Ever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then so, you build a bridge. Absolutely. So you've had um, uh, and are in a u unique position, which is created uh, through determination and relentless hard work. Um, you have a passion for both men and women in football. Uh, you designed your own signature program, A Day in a Life, and continue to run programs. Was this something you knew you wanted to do? Um, or was this an organic process for you? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a creator at heart. Yeah. Everything I've done in my life and my career has been created from what wasn't being done or what was impossible. So I look at situations not as they are, but what can be done in them. And so A Day in the Life was designed to give women the opportunity to learn football from the inside, not feel like outsiders, um, yeah. and, and really bring them into the game and, and make them feel educated because a lot of the times there traditionally haven't been those opportunities for women. Yeah. Um, and that was really from a fan perspective, but do it in a way where it wasn't, you know, demeaning or joking or, you know, base. It was, we're going to bring you out onto the field and get you into the game and educate you through doing. Um, and so it was, you know, it's an exciting program to be able to, um, you know, change the conversation and dynamics surrounding it. Um, plus the women had a chance to learn from female coaches because I put female coaches on the field. I think that's one of the things I've really learned, um, is in power is important in terms of change dynamics. Um, if you want something to change, then take ownership in the change. Yeah. Um, don't just try and get somebody else to do what you want them to do because in that situation, it's their vision, but the programs I've created, whether it's gridiron girls or a day in the life, like I get to make the determination on all of those elements. I get to say um, how the programming is designed and um, who the coaches are and 
that means I'm not trying to convince someone else that women deserve opportunities. I'm creating those opportunities for women through my program. Yeah. And I think that's something that I've seen um, throughout my journey is if, if you want to change things, take ownership in the change, you know, yeah. whether that means um, designing programs or, you know, creating camps or, you know, owning teams, right? Like you can put suggestions, right? People always talk about, for example, um, the, in football, particularly um, the lack of uh, diverse inclusion in the upper coaching ranks and ownership. Um, and, you know, you can, you can say you have to interview X amount of people and you can do all of that, but until you're in the position to pull the trigger, meaning you are that senior person, then the only thing you can do is try and push someone else's decision. You can't pull change because you're in, in the position of ownership. Um, and so those are the things that I've learned is it's hard to get other people to do what you want, not impossible, but when you own it, it's a whole lot easier. Absolutely. So um, uh, you also wanted uh, to bring your camps to underserved communities. What are some of the most rewarding aspects um, of this part of giving back and making a difference? And can you give us any examples? Well, I mean, I've done 35 girls camps across the country and uh, a variety of other camps. Um, yeah. But so all of them are powerful examples, right? Every time I step on the field with kids, it's a powerful example. Seven yeah. out of 10 girls feel there are not enough visible female role models in sports and half will drop out of sports at puberty, which is the time they need confidence and sports develop confidence the most. Absolutely. So anytime I can be that person, um, I, don't I may not necessarily know which girls it changed their life for, but I do know that it changes their lives. Yeah. Um, I also created a program called um, Camp on the Corner at one time, and it was showing kids how they could turn a corner in their life through sports. And that specific program we ran um, in Houston right after the hurricane, um, when everybody had lost everything, um, and we chose a Title I school to do it. I think it was Forest Ridge. And over two days, we had 900 kids who got to experience the on the field camp part, but also they, because it was sponsored by Adidas um, and Adidas really, they really made this program possible. We were able to give uh, brand new sneakers and a t-shirt to 900 kids. That's amazing. You know, and yeah, that- What an awesome experience. Uh, yeah, and I got to speak to them and each of the drills was, you know, it wasn't a football camp per se, like for active football players. It was a camp um, with different drills that anybody could do and all of them were wrapped around um, a life lesson through sports. Right, like resilience, hitting the ground, getting back up and keep going, right? Um, and so we were able to have that experience with 900 kids. Wow. And the, um, and, and it, it actually goes further because Adidas used it as a part of their social responsibility program. And so that meant that they had um, their corporate bigwigs um, come out and help coach the kids. And it was my opportunity and my coach's opportunity. We taught them the drills and how to interact with the kids. Um, and they got to be boots on the ground with the kids too. So yeah. they got to see the importance um, and the impact of what they were giving to the actual kids that they were giving it to. And I think too many times it's like a separation. You yeah. might you might donate money, but you don't you don't see the smile on somebody's face. No. You don't see the sneakers that they took out of the box and then kept the box 
yeah. because that was the nicest pair of sneakers that they had owned in their whole life. Yeah, and incredible. Yeah, and the shoes that they might have exchanged off their feet. Um, and so it was really an impactful situation, not only for the kids, but for the big kids, right? For all the adults. And it was those two camps that really started um, the relationship between myself and Adidas, which has continued from them and um, led to Adidas sponsoring my girls' football camps and for them to, you know, last year at Super Bowl, well, I guess I should say a year and a half ago at Super Bowl, um, to announce me as being signed as a football asset to an Adidas contract. Wow, the, that's incredible. Jeez. Yeah. It was the first time that a, a female in football was signed just like the guys would be signed. And that's amazing. <laughs> well, and it's also it's also interesting to me because you know, most people would picture that as being a direct result of being one of the most one of the best players in the world. Yes. And yet it's years after I was retired as a player. It was the impact on the world that I've had through the sport that led to them citing me, not just being someone who was a sack leader. Exactly. And then obviously it goes on, you know, it will continue on and you will obviously, that will be a big part of your legacy for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you have a doctorate in psychology, a master's in sports psychology um, and a bachelor's degree. Um, how has having acquired all of these degrees, would you say has um, differentiated you from other coaches? Um, I don't know that it, well, I mean, obviously having a master's and a PhD in psychology is, is a part of what makes me great. Yeah. I don't, I don't look at it as, you know, oh, this makes me better than other coaches or, or competing with other coaches. I look at, you know, what's the value to the team. And I think every team should have someone who is, well-versed and an expert in, you know, sports psychology and psychology and inner team dynamics. Now, Absolutely. sometimes that will be in the same package as a coach. Um, sometimes it'll be an outside person, but it's, it's definitely something that should be in all levels of professional sports. Um, and, you know, at times it was uh, something that, you know, like we'd have situations and coaches would look at me and they'd be like, uh, can you, you know, <laughs> kind of like not even know like how to say it. And I'm like, yeah, talk to him. I got it. Right. Yeah. Like, um, and so, yes, it is, it is part of what my, my special sauce is. Yeah. Um, and I think it's always an advantage to understand humans Absolutely. and to, you know, look at Bruce Arians always says like you know can you read their eyes and and really reading your eyes means looking at one person relative to the next and knowing that this day they might need something that they didn't need yesterday yeah. and I learned the skills to do that through my education and interestingly enough a lot of what I focused on um, at different points in my career, I didn't necessarily know that I was doing it to be a good coach, right? Like I, I might've been studying it more from a player's perspective, right? Like how feedback is received and mechanisms for um, feedback so that players and coaches will be on the same page and coach athlete relationships or the psychology of injury or, you know, all of those things that I had studied. Um, I studied long before I had ever coached football, right? I had my PhD before I took my first coaching job. And so it then wasn't, oh, I'm a coach and now I have to learn how to, how to oh, coach. Oh yeah, for sure. Right. It was, 
okay, no, in this situation, this is, you know, these are a few ways that you can handle it. So it was already a really fluid working um, intellect, right, that I had or capacity or language that I could speak yeah. um, that naturally had it. Yeah, that yeah. naturally translated. And, you know, I tell people I'm like really surprised even me at times because I knew more than I, I necessarily would have known to think of. Yeah, sure. Um, so the last two questions, um, what are the three key pieces of advice you would give to others who want to pursue a career um, or similar career or sports career um, um, and to entrepreneurs? Because even though you're in the coaching world and you've transitioned in many different and cross-pollinated across many, I still consider you, uh, you still have entrepreneurial skills. So what would the three key pieces of advice and what legacy would you like to leave? Um, first of all, there is a fine line between brilliance and insanity. Yeah. And if you <laughs> are, um, doing something different, uh, which, you know, entrepreneurs are that, that requires betting on yourself. And yes. that means that though you may see it as brilliance, you will also, also question whether or not you're crazy at times. Mm -hmm. And you will often be told you're crazy by other people. But the truth is that other people, if they saw what you saw, they probably would have already done what you're doing. Exactly. So you can't let them be right. And, you know, I take being called crazy as a compliment because it just means that you are crazy enough to bet on yourself. Yeah. Um, the next one is to make sure that the people surrounding you are people who surround you with tools and love and support and belief, not um, chaos and criticism and um, competition. You, you know, we all deserve people in our lives who have our back, right? And that doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that they'll always have the answers or they'll do stuff for you, but they'll listen when you need to talk. They won't close a door before you even explain the explanation. Um, they will help you see things through and they will celebrate your successes, not compete with you to get there. Um, and I think the third one is really to make sure that you're dialed in on what's important to you um, in terms of the passion that will, will keep you going through the hard times, yeah. right? Um, one of my best known quotes is like to, you know, I think it's like, to be successful in this world, you have to follow passion, not a paycheck. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> right. You know, if, if dollars are driving you, then dollars will also drive you crazy because it, it's a never ending cycle of, I just want more money. And you may or may not like the person who gets that money, right? Because if money is your only goal, then you'll do a lot of crappy things to get it. But if you're driven by passion and belief and heart and spirit in the world that you want to see and who you want to be in it, money will come because you'll work harder than other people who are doing the same things and aren't passionate about it. You know, you'll get up earlier, you'll go longer because it's not just something that you do, it's who you are. And exactly. everything that I've done, you know, People ask, how have you not quit? And I'm like, I can't just quit being myself one day. No. <laughs> right? Like, it's not like I'm going to wake up and be like, yep, not Coach Jen Walter anymore. Today I'm just Frederica or whatever, right? Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a part of my DNA. Now, yeah. now, there may be days when I don't know what to do next. Yes, and we but, all have those days. Right, that's human. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not me anymore. Mm. And so, you know, really make sure that um, when you're going a non-traditional route, that you're doing it 
um, with passion and heart and those things that will help you through the times when it is, you know, not pretty because going on a trail that is a new one means that it will be painful, not polished and not perfect, but it's perfectly yours. Yes, absolutely. And what legacy would you like to leave? Um, I don't know yet. I think I'm, I think so I'm you're too still in the process. <laughs> right. I think I'm too young to know about legacy. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's like, I, I, I hope that where I am now is just the tip of the iceberg of who I am two years from now, three years from now, 10 years from now. Yeah. And that even now in, in what I've done, it is, in no way um, indicative of what I have the capacity to do. And for me, that's what keeps all of us going. Yeah. Um, you know, I used to love the show Married with Children when I was younger. Yeah, and, I remember that too. <laughs> yeah, and you had Al Bundy yeah. sitting on the couch <laughs> talking about his four touchdowns at Polk High School. <laughs> and I never want to be Al Bundy. No. I never to be somebody whose best days were behind her no. um, I always hope that my next accomplishment will be my best one only until the next one happens absolutely well thank you so much for your time today and uh, if people want to connect with you what are the best platforms to do so yeah, um, you can follow me on LinkedIn, though, like I am well past the 30,000 mark. Um, it's sad. There are about 5,000 invitations I can't accept because they cut you off at 30,000. But okay. you can still follow me there. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at jwelter47, welter47 on Instagram, Dr. Jen Welter on Facebook, and my website is jenwelter.com. Well, thank you so much, and hopefully we can have you back in the future to see where you are. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time. You got it. Have a good one.